2 Corinthians chapter 4. I think this is where the pastor has started out on Wednesday nights lately. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. I get there. Second Corinthians chapter four verse thirteen says, "We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak." How many of you believe tonight? Right? We believe. Back in Hebrews chapter eleven verse six, it says, "But without faith." It is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So we believe that in him, but we have to believe that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. There's an advantage to serving God. I think Pastor Kevin says it pays to serve God. It doesn't cost. It pays to serve God. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we don't mind hearing the word, do we? Because that's how faith comes, by hearing and hearing. You know, I was, I was always taught that there's two laws of learning, frequency and recency. Frequency being how often do you hear it? And recency being when was the last time you heard the word? So, you know, for a lot of people, today's Wednesday. We should have heard the word yesterday. Right? We should have heard the word Monday. We should have heard the word Sunday. But many people, you know, might go a long time in between. So in recency, if we haven't heard the word recency or recently, then sometimes you have to almost start over and come back up through it. You know, the past, pastor has a, a way of teaching the word where he'll go for many weeks, and Keith Moore does the same thing, but they have to repeat some of it in the beginning to bring us all back up because frequency and recency are real. How often do you hear it, and how long has it been since you've heard it? So provided we listen, then the last time is still real to us, right, if we listen. I like what Jeannie said there the other Sunday night when she was teaching. She said, do we really listen to the Word, or do we just come to church? And I had to stop and think about that. How many times do we come and we don't really listen to the word, but I was in church? And then you go home and you can say, what did he preach on? Monday morning you get up and say, what was, taught, what was being taught? You know, because our mind goes on holiday every 21 seconds. You know, we just go, it goes on holiday and we think about different stuff. So do we really come to let the word minister to us? I like what Jeannie said one night. She said, we will remember the word that we do. If we do the word, you know, and how many times have we been told back in James it tells us to be ye a doer of the word and not a hearer only because we remember the word that we do. Just the word that we heard a lot of times can, can escape our memory, but the word that we do, we remember that. We remember when we've witnessed to somebody. I was talking to a guy yesterday, and he said every day, he says, I tell people that Jesus is coming back. He said, because I believe the rapture is so soon. He said, I do that every day to somebody. So are we in faith or are we relying upon our own strength and knowledge? You know, we can go about this world in our own strength, but in order to remain strong in faith, we need to remain humble. And to remain humble means we remain dependent upon God or submitted to God a spirit of deference or submission to God. We can't do it in and of ourselves, right? We have to, re we have to be dependent upon him. Turn to James chapter 4, Hebrews and then James. In James chapter 4, verse 6, it says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. The first part of verse 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. So it, he gives more grace to the humble, so we need to submit to God. You know, I remember going out to Ramo on continuing education seminar years ago, 
And the first class that we had out there that, that year was submission. And Keith Moore taught on submission, how to submit and how to be submissive. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. So back in Hebrews it said, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if we diligently seek him and diligently try to let him take control of our life, he will be a rewarder and because we believe. Look at Luke chapter 14. In the book of Luke chapter 14, And we'll look at verse 11. In Luke chapter 14, verse 11, it says, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased or brought low. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I told a story in Sunday school class about a guy that I ran into over in uh, Scotland one year. And he was originally from England, so the English and Scottish, and Scottish don't necessarily mix too good. And he had his desk chair cranked up so high that the desk was pushing into his legs. And, and he did that so that when he was, when you sat in front of his desk, because he had two chairs right in front of his desk, and he was always looking down on you. He had his, he was sitting up there like, yes, I mean, the chair was, so, he was, at an angle because it was so propped up. And then one guy in, in the same building, I scheduled a meeting down on the first floor where the materials people were or the inventory control people. And he was the vice president of the finance. And I scheduled a meeting for one afternoon to talk over some issues. And he came down to the meeting and he said, he looked at me and he said, don't you ever schedule another meeting down here. If you want me, you come up to where I am. Well, needless to say, those people got abased. You know, God can't exalt pride like that. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Turn back to First Peter chapter 5. We're in Second Peter. We'll go to First Peter chapter 5. And we'll start with verse 5. In 1 Peter 5, 5, it says, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you, in due time. You know, humility is, is about a desperate dependence on Jesus. Not, I didn't do it in and of myself. We're doing it because we have a desperate dependence on Jesus and serve him with a heart of trust and obedience. Humility is revealed when we recognize that we're not here to be served, but to serve God and others in a way that the world will see Jesus. Turn to Philippians Chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, I might not read it all, but let me read part of it. In chapter 2, starting verse 1 down through verse 11, we can see, let's just go to verse um, 2. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. But in lowliness of mind, or in humbleness, or in humility, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now, I know Dan does that to Kim. He esteems Kim better than himself, right? You know, but let each of us esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him 
and given him a name which is above every name. So we can see that humbleness is to serve others and not to downplay others or think that you're better than others. But, you know, sometimes in the world, it's easy to get that way, you know, when you see how people act. Let's, I want to take a quick look at two people who humbled themselves or they were humbled. One, was humb- one humbled themselves and one was humbled. Because the Bible says if you don't humble yourself, you'll be a base. So you'll be humbled, right? You'll be brought down. But before we go there, let's go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. And we'll look at verse 12. Matthew 23, verse 12. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So I'll just tell the story. We won't turn there. Eric wants to say by 7.30, so no. But in Daniel chapter 4, well, let's go back to Daniel 4. We've got time. Let's go back to Daniel chapter 4. We're going to look at a man that would not humble himself, so he got humbled. Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, he had a dream. Daniel came and interpreted the dream to him. Daniel tried to encourage him to turn to the Lord and turn from his wicked ways. So in Daniel chapter 4, we'll catch up with it in verse 25. But Daniel interpreted the dream to him. In verse 25, Daniel chapter 4 says, That they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. And seven times shall pass over thee, or seven years, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule. Wherefore, O king, and this is where Daniel was trying to convince him, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. And then verse 29 says, at the end of 12 months, so the whole year passed after this prophecy. I believe that the year passed because God was giving Nebuchadnezzar time to repent, time to get his life back in order. But he didn't. Look in verse 30. The king spake and said, is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell from heaven of there fell a voice from heaven and said, The kingdom is departed from thee. And in the same hour, verse thirty three, was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. For seven years he lived out with the oxen because he would not humble himself. God gave him a whole year after the dream was interpreted to him. In verse 27, Daniel tried to tell him, but he wouldn't listen. So he would not humble himself, so he got humbled. And then at the end of seven years, he came back, and in verse 34, let's go to 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the kingdom of he- the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. He had to learn it the hard way. So many people want to learn things by the school of hard knocks. They won't listen to counsel. You know, they want to learn the, the hard way. Now let's contrast that to another guy in Ezekiel chapter 2. So go to Ezekiel chapter 2. Here's a guy that God wanted to talk to, to send out and speak to a hard, hard-headed hard people. And in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 1, 
said, And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon thy feet, and I will speak unto thee. And the Spirit entered into me when he spake unto me, and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spoke unto me. So here's a guy, when, when, the, when God was talking to him, he said, I want to hear what you have to say. And it says, I heard him that spoke unto me. And he listened, and he obeyed. So he humbled himself, and then God exalted him. Even though God sent him to a bunch of people, the challenge to Ezekiel to go and speak to these people, it was a big challenge. But he did it because he listened to God. He says, when the Spirit entered Ezekiel, he heard what was being said. He listened. He humbled himself, despite what he was to go to do. He submitted to the voice of the Lord. So he got exalted. So if we humble ourselves to God, we'll be exalted. And our walk of faith will be rewarding, right? Because Hebrews eleven six says, he, we must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. But during our walk of faith, we're still in this world, sad to say. But I know soon and very soon we'll go to see the king. And as such, we face circumstances. We face people. We face situations where our faith is going to be challenged, right? And so turn to James chapter 1. But we got to rely, we got to remember that we got to turn ourselves to God. We got to humble ourselves to God so that He can exalt us. And it's His strength. In James chapter 1, I want to read it out of the New Living Translation. From here, here to the end, I'm going to read some of it out of the New Living Translation. Some of it will contrast to the King James. But in James chapter 1, let's go to verse 4. Verse 4 says, let patience have her perfect work. You know, We can humble ourselves, and we're going to face a lot of things in this life. And it says here that let patience have her perfect work. Let me read that out of the New Living Translation. We'll just start with verse 1 in uh, James 1.1. This letter is from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is written to Jewish Christians scattered among the nations. Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, Let it be an opportunity for joy. That's a challenge. It says, let it be. It's not joy, but let it be an opportunity for joy. I can't find the tape, but years ago in the old sanctuary, I spoke a message on just another opportunity, and I would love to have a copy of that because I don't remember what all I said. But I know one of my bosses at JLG in, in years gone by, he would come by my office and he'd say, well, Rodney, just another opportunity. I said, yep, Ben. He said, they lurk in every corner. I said, they're not over, only in every corner, they're all along the wall. Because you're always loaded with opportunities. Even in, forget JLG, but anywhere we go, it's loaded, life is loaded with opportunities. What are we doing? How are we going to respond for that? And James here says, When trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. Verse 3, for when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Now, I I find in in the King James and and the New Living that patience, endurance, long-suffering are kind of interchangeable. You know, they're kind of like synonyms. But it says, so let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. You know, so we need to have patience. We need to have patience with others. That's challenging in the dam. Sometimes our patience wears thin. You know, we, we got a gas pump that when you first turn it on, you got to wait and wait. And sometimes... Wait again before you squeeze the handle. 
But, you know, everybody's in this instant society, you know, where we can't wait at McDonald's for three minutes, right? It, they got to have it right away. And I often wonder, how do they get that cooked and make it fresh if it's right away? From the time you drive from the pay booth to the pickup booth, if they have it ready, I'm thinking, wait a minute, that's probably been there for a couple hours just under the micro, under the heat lamp or something, you know, but we can't wait. You know, but we got to have patience with others. Sometimes we even got to have patience with ourselves. And it'd be sad to say, but sometimes we get out of patience with God. I want it done now, right? It's got to be instant. But patience, it says, let it grow. J King James in, in verse 4 says, but let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Well, in order to do that, then I'm going to have to submit to God. And if I submit to God, truly, I don't mind waiting because I know that God, according to Hebrews 11, 6, is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So what if it comes instantly? So what if it takes a day? What if it takes two days? What if it takes a week? Am I patient to, to wait on that? Patience is a fruit of the Spirit, right? I was going to try to sing, but since Gary wants to sing, maybe Gary would want to sing us, he's still working on me to make me what I, want, what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make this moon and stars, the earth and the sun, Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be because he's still working on me, right? Can you feel God still working on you, right? We need to hear that word. How long has it been since I last heard it? So patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Turn back to Galatians 5.22. Galatians, G-E, right before Ephesians. Galatians 5.22. I got to get there. Galatians 5:22 in the New Living Bible it says, "But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us: love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control." Here there is no conflict with the law. The Holy Spirit, if, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, so when he controls our lives, that means I have humbled myself before God. I'm not trying to do it on my own. I remember a guy that, that we used to claim that he didn't really need God because he could do anything himself in the natural. But, you know, with God, we can do a lot more in the natural, but we can also do a lot more in the spirit. I think King, King James says, you know, we, or let's start with verse 17. I'm sorry, I wanted to go back up to 17. Verse 17. 16, 17. The old sinful nature loves to do evil, which is just opposite from what the Holy Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite from what the sinful nature, nation, nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, and your choices are never free from this conflict. But when you are directed by the Holy Spirit, you are no longer subject to the law. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, your lives will produce these evil results. And then if you go on down to the end of 21, it says, Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. So patience comes from God. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit if we humble ourselves. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 
and we'll start reading with verse. No, let's just start with verse one, so we can catch up to it. I don't like to just take a verse, pull it out, and just read it because I want to know what it's talking about. You know, before that, as God's partners, I'm going to read out of the New Living for a change. As God's partners. We beg you not to reject this marvelous message of God's great kindness. For God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. We try to live in such a way that no one will be hindered from finding the Lord by the way we act. And so no one can find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we try to show that we are the true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. We have been beaten, been put in jail, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion. Hear that, Gary? Worked to exhaustion. I mean, that means we, we work hard, right? <laughs> Learning from Dan. Endured sleepless nights and gone without food. Verse 6 says, We have proved ourselves by our purity, by our understanding, by our patience. We've proved ourselves by our patience, our kindness, our sincere love, and the power of the Holy Spirit. We have faithfully preached the truth. God's power has been working in us. We have righteousness as our weapon, both to attack and defend ourselves. But he says we have proved ourselves by our patience. Our patience shows, right? I I pumping gas the other day, and this lady was trying to use the pump. And I said, just be patient. She said, I can't be patient. i got to get it done. I can't be patient. And I'm like, just be patient. Just just hang on. And and, uh, we prove ourselves by our patience. And sometimes that's challenging, isn't it? It's a challenge to us. You know, we, we get upset about what's going on or what's not going on, the time and everything. Go to Romans chapter 15. I was going to expand this message to then go in to talk about tolerance. Because how, how long should we be patient? Well, we should be patient. But then I was going to talk about, well, how tolerant should we be? But we're not going to go there. We're just going to stop with patience tonight. But look at Romans chapter 15, and let's look at verse, let's read, start with verse 1. We may know that these things make no difference, but we cannot just go ahead and do them to please ourselves. We must be considerate of the doubts and fears of those who think these things are wrong. And I think if you go back and look in verse chapter 14, it's talking about some people don't want to eat this and some people don't want to eat that and, you know, drink this or drink that. And, and, and that can cause division among people if we let it. And it says, we must be considerate of the doubts and fears of those who think these things are wrong. We should please others. If we do what helps them, we will build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't please himself. As the scripture says, those who insult you are also insulting me. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. They give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But you notice it doesn't say that it will, we will be rewarded instantly. Right? Some things could be progressive. Some things could be instant. Verse 5. May God, who gives this patient, patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other. So we can see there that patience says, May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, That patience comes from God. It's a fruit of the Spirit, right? It's the fruit of the Spirit given to us. So if we don't have patience, then it tells me that we're not allowing the Spirit of God to control us. 
we haven't humbled ourselves the way we should humble us. And then it goes on and says, to live in harmony with each other, each with the attitude of Christ Jesus toward the other. Then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So accept each other just as Christ has accepted you. That's a challenge. I've got to accept other people. They've got to accept me. In King James in verse 2, uh, let's see, verse 2. Verse 2 of New Living says, We should please others. If we do what helps them, we will build them up in the Lord. In the King James it says that we can please your neighbor for his good and edification. But sometimes we get bullheaded and we only want to please ourselves, right? But it says we need to please others. Go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And let's look at verse 7. Let's start with verse 7. Colossians chapter 3, verse 7. You used to do them when your life was still part of the world, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old evil nature and all its wicked deeds. In its place... You have clothed yourselves with a brand new nature that is continually being renewed as you learn more and more about Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, hearing and hearing and hearing, and we don't get tired of hearing that. Who created this new nature within you? In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be the holy people whom he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. You must make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. We must make allowance for people being different. That's challenging to do. You know, a lot of times in business now, you hear about diversity and inclusion. I was watching the inauguration today, and they were talking about diversity and people of this ethnic and this belief. And the president is now, he's Catholic, and he likes to go to Catholic mass. And it says, you must make allowance for each other's face and forgive each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. But you must clothe yourself with humility and patience. That's a choice that I make or don't make. But I got to do that. I got to close myself, clothe myself with that. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 verse, I think, 6. We'll start in verse 6. This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It's changing lives everywhere just as it changed yours that very first day you heard and understood the truth about God's great kindness to sinners. Well, let's just jump down to verse 11. Take your time. We also pray that you will be strengthened with his glorious power so that you will have all the patience and endurance you need. Well, if I'm going to be strengthened with all his glorious power, then I'm going to have to humble myself because I don't have it in and of myself to get that power. I've got to be strengthened with his glorious power, and I only get that by humbling myself and being dependent upon God. Not humbling yourself to think lowly, because the Bible says, you know, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to think soberly. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 
And let's look at verse 12. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Paul said, How thankful I am to Christ Jesus our Lord for considering me trustworthy and appointing me to serve him, even though I used to scuff at the name of Christ, Go down to verse 16. But this is why God had mercy on me, so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. You know, if you go back to the Old Testament, there's a lot of scriptures that talk about how the children of Israel tested God's patience. And they provoked him. If The New Living Translation says that they tested God's patience. And they provoked the Holy One of Israel. That's back in Psalms. It says, your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw everything I did. Psalm 106, verse, not verse 14 says, they tested God's patience in that dry wasteland. You know, God has patience, but God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. You know, he gave Nebuchadnezzar a whole year to shape up, and Nebuchadnezzar decided not to do that. Go to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And we'll look at verse 1. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. But as for you, promote the kind of living that reflects right teaching. Teach the older men to exercise self-control to be worthy of respect, and to live wisely. They must have strong faith and be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that is appropriate for someone serving the Lord. They must not go around speaking evil of others and must not be heavy drinkers. So, Linda, I think you're a little bit older than I am. Just remember that. You're not to be a heavy drinker. It says teach the older women, you know, not to be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and be pure, to take care of their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely in all they do. And you yourself must be an example to them by doing good deeds of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. So let's jump back up there to verse uh, 2. They must have strong faith and be filled with love and patience. So let's go back to James 1, 4, and we'll close. <clears throat> James chapter 1, verse 4. We used it in the beginning, but we'll use it here to close with. James chapter 1, verse 4. And New Living says, So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. King James says, but let patience have her perfect work. You know, you only have patience if you have humility, right? If you've depended upon God, if you've committed yourself to God. So when you see someone blow off the handle, you know they're not following the Spirit. I know none of you have ever blown off the handle, right? Cindy has never blown off the handle. Dan's never blown off the handle. Dave's never blown off the handle, right? He's so tolerant, and he just lets patience have her perfect work. That you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. It says that you're, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. Because people are watching that, Right? We've got to have patience. We've got to have humility. 
So that's the word I have for you tonight. That's the word God gave me. I wanted to treat it just like another Sunday school lesson. I'm not the holy roller preacher to yell and scream and shout and, and dance, but, but I think the word is good. You know, we got to have humility. We got to be dependent upon God because when in these days, we see a lot of people that are not dependent on God and we see a lot of people that are not patient and sometimes we ourselves are not patient. Sometimes we just don't want to let God have control. We want to make things happen, but we can't do that. We've got to let God do it. Because In Hebrews eleven six, we must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So if I humble myself to God and if I let the fruit of the Spirit come out in me, I'm going to be rewarded. Right? You're going to be rewarded. We're going to be rewarded. You know, these are not the days, as Pastor Kevin has said in his messages, these are not the days to play with our faith loosely, right? It's, it's, it's time to get committed because we don't know what's going to happen in this world, but we do know what's going to happen, right? We know that the rapture is going to happen soon and very soon. I don't know what day. I thought years ago, I told my dad before he'd passed away, I said, Dad, Daddy, if you just wait five more years, maybe we'll all go together. That was 20 years ago. <laughs> so I don't know the day, but we know it's going to happen, don't we? And then it says that we're going to be rewarded for what we have done in our body, for what we have done in this life. And it says, and we will give an account of every idle word. How many idle words have we ever said, Dave? Two or three? A couple. Just a couple. We can count them all in one hand, probably. You know, but we're going to give an account of that. We're going to give an account of what we have done in our body. And, and that's a challenge for us. So let's close in prayer.